Saunas is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Saunas and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are taking a look at some player props for the 2020 NFL season and try to sort through all the noise at training camp with Chris Raybon of the Action Network, getting his thoughts on how you sift through all that noise, try to find some good prop bets for 2020. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Fang. You can find his work over at the Power Rank. Com. Ed, NBA playoffs, exciting so far. They are in full swing, and it's been fun. How you doing today? Doing pretty good. Been enjoying the NBA playoffs. Had the uh, good fortune of one of the games I caught was the the Mavericks-Clippers mm-hmm. game, uh, and uh, Luka's shot. And uh, it was funny. The markets didn't budge at all <laughs> after that performance by Dallas, and uh, they kind of got obliterated last night. So, yeah. so it goes, but... You know, hopefully Dallas will win Game Six and we get a little bit of uh, Game Seven excitement. Yeah, it's been it's been interesting. I, again, I just like I love it hasn't been as much recently, but I love having the games on during the day. Keeps my Twitter right. timeline exciting, which is uh, always a high priority for me at least. So uh, it's <laughs> definitely been fun, but it's still uncertainty when it comes to college football. Um, I want to sure. get a sentiment reading from you. How are we feeling with regards to there actually being those three conferences playing this fall? Yeah, we'll see. I mean, we got some bad news out of the University of Alabama this morning with with all their cases, uh, a caseload that, uh, you know, would be news if it were some other country like New Zealand. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, I'm kind of looking at what John Sheeran's putting up on FanDuel Sportsbook. So he's got he's got title odds for three conferences. Mm -hmm. So to me, that tells me uh, that he thinks they're going to play. He hasn't put win totals up for those conferences yet, which is (laughs) data that I really need. But, um, but, uh, yeah, I, I really don't know. I, you yeah. know, kids are coming back on campus. Everyone here in our is freaking out because kids are already coming back and there's pictures of kids not doing the smartest things. And that doesn't mean every kid is not doing the smartest things, but there's, there's certainly examples out there. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, I think the thing for me is that, like, I know I can get to the start of the NFL season, have all my stuff ready, and then I can get ready for college football. It's a nice little Based gap. On the schedule. Yeah, you get the NFL stuff, the preseason stuff done, and then transition to college. I think that they have you in mind, Ed, when they're doing this. So um, <laughs> grateful to them for doing that. They've had the same stuff here in Syracuse where they've had kids, you know, doing what 18-year-olds are going to do. I mean, like, it's hard to blame them when they're put in a situation that's going to happen. But speaking of Syracuse... Our guest today is a Syracuse alum, Chris Raybon. Uh, make sure you find Chris on Twitter, at Chris Raybon, also a, an alum of NumberFire.com. He was a writer here for us back in the day, has since graduated to some awesome things over at the Action Network. He's one of their co-hosts on uh, the Action Network NFL podcast, which won an FSGA award this past year for uh, the best betting podcast. He's a senior editor at the Action Network. You can find him on Twitter, at Chris Raybon. We're going to talk to Raybon uh, about the 2020 NFL season, about talking about player props, what we can actually get that's actionable out of training camp information, and the differences between fantasy football and betting. So looking forward to having that conversation with Chris in just a bit. But first, the NBA playoffs are upon us, and FanDuel has you covered. Compete in the Mountain Dew NBA free play from now through September 4th for your chance to win your seat in a virtual event with NBA legends Gary Payton and Ray Allen. With each entry, you'll also be entered into the King of the Mountain three-point bonus for your chance to win a share of $15,000 brought to you by Mountain Dew, official sponsor of the NBA. For more details, Visit FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app today. Eligibility restrictions apply. This has also been a string of NFL podcasts we've had here on Covering the Spread. We had Orlando Skandrick, the former cornerback for the Dallas Cowboys and most recently the Philadelphia Eagles. He talked about the impact of no training camp, what that does for offenses, defenses, which teams may be able to take advantage of that. We talked with Whale Capper, of course, to get his thoughts on the NFL, and also Aaron Schatz of Football Outsiders uh, to talk about the DVOA projections for this upcoming year, and I'm happy to add Chris into that fold as well. So let's get to Chris Raybon. Again, follow him on Twitter, at Chris Raybon. Covering the present. Let's welcome Chris Raybon into covering the spread and back into the airways of Numberfire. Chris, it's great to to borrow your brain once again here for Numberfire. How are you doing today? 
I'm doing good, man. My brain is is for you guys, so you know, it, <laughs> it's my pleasure. It's awesome to have you back. A little uh, little reunion here, back over on the airways with number fire and good timing too, because NFL season is just around the corner, but it's been. A weird couple of months. Uh, so what did you do to kind of fill the void when sports were on hiatus for so long? Uh, different things. When you know, I was watching a lot of movies at first. Uh, then I kind of switched once uh, sports started to come back. I was like betting obscure things like UFC and, and eSports. And now I'm, <laughs> I'm really loving playoff basketball every day. I mean, it, it's kind of cool to have you know, three, four games, right? At least we were having, you know, three, four games a day right. um, in August. Uh, so it's almost kind of like I'm I'm so excited about playoff basketball that the NFL season kind of snuck up on me a little bit. I mean, I did bet every, like, spread, you know, five months ago. Right. It's for week one, but uh, nah, it's kind of sneaking up on me a little bit. Did you stick with UFC or any of the esports stuff that you picked up, or did those kind of go by the wayside once NBA was available? Yeah, those kind of went by the wayside. But I will say this, if, you know, if anyone's out there, um, that's kind of into betting. You can follow me in the Action Network app. Um, you know, I put all my picks in there and each night to, to track them and uh, you can see them. But I, I've been betting hockey. I've been betting baseball. So I'm kind of well-rounded amongst the, the four, at least, you know, the, the major sports going on now. Um, whatever I see value on, I just kind of, you know, fire at. Yeah, I pulled it up and I was checking out your stuff. And you got a lot of stuff for NBA today. So I appreciate you taking time away from the sweats. Uh, to talk with us here. Were you always an NBA better, or is this kind of a new thing for you? I started with NFL. I mean, I got yeah. into, you know, this industry, you know, doing NFL, but uh, always loved the NBA. And I actually think the NBA is the, I don't want to say easiest, because I don't think betting is easy, but it's the most predictable sport in terms of, um, you know, the day-to-day -day or game-to-game -game variance. So, um, it's a lot of fun to bet, and, and the prop bets are really fun, too. So I uh, love NBA. All right. So uh -huh. you talked about, Chris, about how work, football season's kind of sneaking up on you. And I think that that's true for all of us. It's true for me, very much so. You look at, like, Google Trends, it's the same thing, where fantasy football has been not as searched. And that's tough because we have no preseason. And preseason gives us a lot of data for, for fantasy, but also for betting player props. And both those things are dependent on news, they're dependent on training camp, they're dependent on preseason. We don't have that news right now, so what has it been like for you these past couple of weeks trying to get that information when things are so limited right now? I mean, I say the NFL season has been sneaking up on I me. Mean, meanwhile, I've had my player projections, you know, <laughs> it, it, you know, done since like March. But I, I think that a lot of the time it can be information overload and you really have to... I think whether you're betting or playing fantasy, whatever you're doing, you have to understand what kind of information is actually going to, uh, you're actually going to be able to quantify and incorporate into, uh, you know, your, you know, how you're making your bets or how you're, you know, what you're going to do in fantasy. Because if not, you're just kind of jumping from place to, it's like monkey brain, you know, you're just jumping from like report to report and you don't know what to do with all this information. So for me, at this time of year, if, if we're talking about fantasy, I'm just kind of looking for things that could uh, influence my projections for player usage. Uh, you know, I, I don't really care, uh, you know, which guy had like a great day at camp or made all the throws or, you know, made somebody miss or gave the first team defense problems uh, unless that is going to tangibly impact what I have projected for a player's usage. And then uh, for betting, it's kind of, uh, I think for betting, the most important thing is, just kind of understanding how coaches think and, and, and what they, uh, you know, how they kind of view their teams and view strategy. So I'm just always kind of reading and looking out for things like that because in the season, I think the NFL betting market is more or less efficient. You know, there aren't going to be any major just bad lines out there. So to really get an edge in betting, you're going to have to kind of understand coaching, which I think, you know, there's been some work done on this, but Coaching has like a huge impact, but it's really hard to quantify, you know, right after quarterback uh, play and quarterback efficiency, coaching is really the thing that's going to um, decide whether a team wins or loses and, and how they play. So I'm um, just kind of understanding not what I think coaches should do, but uh, what they think and what the organization thinks, who's making the decisions uh, and how this is going to impact what they do. Because during the season, a lot of times it's, it's really me, you know, kind of, yeah, there, there's a number in mind and a model and, and, you know, some data behind it. But whether I'm going to actually pull the trigger on a bet a lot of times is going to come down to those intangible factors that are much harder to quantify. 
uh, light coaching, uh, offensive line as well. So kind of looking out for things like that um, more than just the, you know, the, whatever the buzzworthy uh, headline of the day is. So, Chris, I mean, you can definitely get a lot of coaching once we're in the season. We're not in the season yet. Um, again, no preseason games. Um, what do you try to listen to coaches? Like, how do you how do you get stuff from beat writers? Like, where 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 is your information flow uh, now that we're in August? So I love the Athletic. Uh, I have a subscription. Shout out to everybody there. They do a great job and um, just very detailed analysis. You know, usually new articles every day from from the beat writers and. Uh, I really like the 53-man roster projections because it kind of gives you an overview uh, of the entire roster, and um, you can kind of you get little tidbits about, you know, not only which players are standing out, which players are likely to to, to play, and, and kind of, but you get by you also by relation get you know insight on scheme, and, and again just think you know organizational philosophy, coaching philosophy, uh, and things like that. So. Um, just really trying to soak in as much information uh, as possible rather than, you know, I, I don't necessarily seek out anything specific, but I, I tend to start with those 53-man roster projections because it's just giving me uh, an overview. And then from there, I might have, you know, questions that come out of that that I say, hey, you know, hey, based on what, you know, I saw here, um, you know, I, this team might you know run a lot more than I expected or they, this I didn't realize how much they might struggle with the, the O-line or something like that. And then I'll go, you know, from there, just do more research and, just Google, man. Just every there's so much good content out there, um, and it's very specific between you know Reddit, Google, uh, the Athletic, you know things like that. So I'm just trying to soak in the information that I think is gonna again allow me to uh, kind of adjust a prediction or projection in some type of way that that will uh, that will give me an edge. I remember those 53 man projections were like so key for like preseason DFS last year, like rest in peace preseason DFS, but like those were amazing for that too. So I'd recommend those as well. And you mentioned, you know, how you do kind of be selective in what you want to react to when it comes to preseason reports and stuff like that. Have there been any nuggets that have come out that have actually inspired you to bet props for the subcommittee season? Or have you been trying to hold off as a result of the lack of information? I, well, so I bet a lot, right? I bet a lot <laughs> every day. And again, if like you follow me in the app, the action app, you know this. Uh, I'm <laughs> making a ton of bets on the NBA. I'll throw some hockey in there, some baseball. So it doesn't make sense for me to kind of tie up a lot of my bankroll in sure. futures bets. And also, when you kind of relate it to training camp, the props that are posted are generally the star players, the you know the, the most popular players. And those guys, you're not really learning – anything new about those guys in camp. So, you know, some of the props, I haven't bet many, but uh, I did bet uh, Ben Roethlisberger for comeback player of the year uh, a few months ago at, I think, like four to one. I think he's in a, a really good spot. You know, Pittsburgh threw the ball at the highest rate, you know, the year he was, uh, before he got injured, they still have some pretty good talent out there. So, and they could win a lot of games, you know, and if they kind of challenge Lamar Jackson uh, for that division, I think Ben will be in that conversation. A uh, uh, little bit, put put a little down on uh, Dak Prescott to win MVP. I think uh, we've kind of seen the, the young star quarterbacks of the league have their times and, you know, Mahomes had his and it, he's still having his uh, as has Lamar. But uh, I think Dak could kind of be the next guy to pop and, and win that award, especially if Dallas makes that leap. They were, uh, pretty unlucky last year. If you look at their margin of victory, uh, I believe it was around plus five or so. And margin of victory, of course, for anyone not in the know, uh, is more predictive of future uh, performance than something like win-loss record, something basic like that. So um, Dallas actually was pretty good in that area, uh, better than Philly, yet finished eight and eight. Philly goes nine and seven and makes the playoffs. So uh, I think Dallas is, is a team that's on a rise. Unfortunately, they're also the chalk. So like, if you're trying to bet the <laughs> NFC East, who's going to win? Dallas is 50-50 or something like that, like even money or, or even uh, the slight favor, uh, you know, minus 110 or something. That's just a bad bet because there are no team in a four-team division uh, unless they are just like utterly ridiculously dominant and even then is going to have, you know, 50-50 odds uh, to win the division when there's three other teams in there. So, like, it's, like, it's, it's kind of – the key for betting is, like, understanding – how you're going to actually utilize this information. Right. And a lot of that comes down to what what uh, lines the books are offering. So you have to just understand, like, I always think in probabilities. I think that's the biggest thing I learned from kind of diving into betting so much, um, you know, along with the fantasy is that 
you always have to think in probabilities, uh, range of outcomes, and, and then expected value. So, you know, if, when I see a line like Dallas is, you know, minus 110 to win the NFC East, some people might see that and say, that's yeah, not bad. It's just like, you know, a spread bet. You know, I think they're the best team. I think they're, you know, most likely to win it. But me, I'm like, oh, my God, their real odds of winning the NFC East is probably, like, you know, 37 percent. Right. That's still leading the NFC East for me. But, you know, it, it's there's no there's no value there. If you're betting for value, you have to bet on the Giants. Because they're like right. 10 to 1. And there's just not that big of a spread. And the Giants get to play the Redskins twice, just like the other two teams. So, uh, you know, that's kind of how I'm thinking about things. So, basically, you could use a Dak Prescott bet as a way to buy low on the Cowboys without betting the team at the the, the chalk number. Absolutely. And that's especially true uh, for someone like me and, you know, people out there that kind of invest into, you know, predicting sports in a variety of ways. So, uh, you know, in fantasy, we know that the optimal strategy is going to be late round quarterback. And if I am going to waste a bullet on an early round quarterback, it's going to be Patrick Mahomes. Like, I'm just going to go for <laughs> the guy that might throw 60 touchdowns this year. So uh, the guy who threw 50 touchdowns in his first in career starts number two through 17. I'm not just going to kind of willy nilly, you know, I can make a good case for any one of the top six quarterbacks, but it's just not the optimal strategy. So I'm going to be selective there. So, yeah, always looking for a way to kind of, um, you know, buy in and invest. So that's a great point that you just made. Yeah, for sure. Um, my numbers love Dak and uh, their success rate numbers from last year. So, and I'm I'm not too high on the rest of the division. So, definitely agree with you there, Chris. Um, so you come from the DFS world, and and a lot of those players are coming in and and betting player props like we just talked about. What are some uh, cautionary tales that you would tell these players when making this transition? The first thing, always, always, always start looking to bet unders, like. Even if you see an over with good value, uh, realize that the majority of bettors that bet on props are going to be casual bettors, uh, likely for betting on their like hometown player or a guy that's been hot lately or whatever it may be. And just in general, the betting public heavily skews toward the over. So pretty much every prop bet line that a book will set, they set – expecting people to bet the over so they'll usually make it too high um the, the real key though i would say beyond that is understanding probability just basic probability um for example you know you don't have to be like a a, a stat geek to just understand that if you see a line and they're usually like you know over 4.5 there's always that 0.5 the hook or whatever Anytime you like, let's say you project the player for more than that, or his average is more than that. There's a difference between the average and the median. The median is the 50 percent, uh, you know what the you know what's going to happen 50 percent of the time on each side. So, if like if you have a player projected for let's say 4.9 uh, catches or something, and his prop is four or four and a half, and you say, okay, my my numbers over that, I think it's got a good chance of hitting. Uh, it's pr you probably don't because the median of a decimal number like that, usually if it's a low number, it's going to be something called a Poisson distribution. But pretty much a good rule of thumb is the median is always going to be down. So if a player averages, you know, let's say 80 yards a game, his median is likely to be 70 or something like that because, you know, zero is going to be the, the low end limit limiter. But there's no, there's not as much of an upper end limit. Like a guy who averages 80 yards could have a 200 yard game or something, and that's going to skew the average more than having like a negative two yard game even <laughs> will. So um, just always kind of remember that and um, understand what the the juice uh, implies. So you know, I, I do this so much that I don't need to use like a probability calculator, but. Um, you know, just understand like, okay, minus 110 it, it is about 50, uh, you know, 52.5 percent or something like that. And then minus 125 is about, uh, you know, 56 percent. And you just your your likelihood of hitting that bet needs to be higher than the juice that that line implies. And you need to have a little cushion, too. So I'm not just looking for like, okay, well, I think this is going to happen 53 percent of the time and the odds imply it's going to happen 52 percent. So it's I'm going to bet it like I usually want a five, you know, or 10% edge at least because there's going to be variance, you know, just random unpredictable variance. You're going to need an edge. There's always regression to the mean. Um, so to really get value, you just need to kind of understand, understand uh, what the, the juice uh, implies in terms of the probability. Yeah. And the player prop discussion too is relevant for like season long props because 
we see these huge numbers there. It's the same thing, but there are so many paths to an under when it comes to those player props. And I think that's the way that if you don't have any probabilities, you can think paths. Like, what are the paths of this person coming up short? If there are, like, 16 paths to them hitting the under on that number, you should probably bet the under. So it's a relevant discussion that you were just having, uh, both for season-long props, but also for single-game props. Let's go beyond just player props here, Chris. Uh, how are you viewing NFL future bets broadly? with the uncertainty around this season. It seems like things are kind of stable in the NFL with the, the COVID testing numbers being, after the, the false positives, being pretty good, but still a lot of uncertainty here. So have you made any alterations to your futures process to account for that uncertainty, or is it pretty similar to past seasons for you? It, I mean, it's obviously a little different, but I, I think you're you're always just looking to spot the, the market inefficiencies. And yeah, I think that, so... A, a big narrative this year, and I, I, I kind of want to say false narrative, or at least something that's unproven, is that you know rookies are going to struggle and you know continuity, blah blah blah. But at the end of the day, it's like it's hard to quantify that or prove that that's going to happen, you know, until it does. The last time we had a lockout uh, or, or a work stoppage, I should say, was 2011. We don't really. You're always looking for relevant sample sizes when, or you know, when you're trying to discern potential outcomes, right? So there was a work stoppage from mid-March all the way through July in 2011. And people were worried, and, and players weren't even on Zooms back then. Like, there was just no <laughs> interaction between the, you know, these franchises and their players. And so, you know, they come back, and what ends up happening is offenses set what were then records for uh, efficiency across a broad range of categories, uh, including, you know, passing, uh, you know, yards per attempt and all that. So you have to remember to kind of think through these things and don't just kind of lazily accept a narrative as true because people say, oh, you know, offenses may struggle, rookies may struggle, you know, quarterbacks, this and that. But in reality, the hardest thing to do is play defense um, when you're unprepared. And so, if a rookie, for example, has talent and is fast, like a guy like Henry Ruggs, you know, people kind of don't know what to do with him. We're getting the Brian Edwards buzz now. Like, I think Henry Ruggs is going to go bonkers this year because he's really fast. Defenses haven't seen any tape, not even anything in the preseason. That you know, we don't. They just don't know. They're not going to be prepared. It's like the same reason in DFS or prop betting. If there's a, a team with a backup corner or or a, or a secondary that's kind of hasn't played together as much, you're usually targeting that that secondary so don't kind of get caught up in, in one side of, of things and um you know avoid the other so but at the same time there are certain things where there are certain situations like seattle i love seattle i think seattle was extremely undervalued in the market and that's a situation where every year we see the same thing russell wilson since he was drafted in 2012 they've never had a losing season they've averaged 10.75 wins per year and they are like plus 250 or something to win the division because, you know, of all the hype on the 49ers, uh, which, you know, last year was the year to buy in a 49ers, not this year. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you get you're getting pretty good odds for them to to make the playoffs. You're getting pretty good odds for their their win total, uh, Super Bowl conference, everything. And they have an extremely good chance of getting there because the floor is so high. So you're looking for range of outcomes and you're saying, OK. <clears throat> I'm probably going to get a winning season regardless. Like Seattle had an under the radar last season, uh, season last year. They won 11 games. So uh, yep. it's like just looking for situations like that. Um, another one is when there are kind of two uh, favorites in a division or co-favorites and people are kind of discounting the, the third team. So I, I think that there's a situation where in the NFC West, because everyone, you know, now – finally loves the 49ers now they're overvalued the Seahawks are number two they're a great bet but there's also some some pretty good value on the Rams you know they've never had a losing season in, in Sean McVay's tenure they're averaging 11 wins per year uh, people are kind of just writing them off but that's still a, a team that you know again pretty well coached uh, even in a bad year last year went nine and seven uh, so you know if you're looking for kind of a long shot bet with with, with good value uh, the, the, the Cardinals are like the trendy pick, but the Rams are actually, I think, the best value. Um, they're just a more well-rounded uh, team. And then th there's the same situation kind of in the 
NFC uh, North for, for a little bit of a different reason. I think the Packers and Vikings, everyone just kind of expects those two teams to be, you know, at the top. But in reality, if you look at the numbers and there's a lot of metrics you could use, but essentially there's not really as much of a difference between the Packers, the Vikings, and the Bears, as you would think. Uh, the Packers got extremely lucky last year, two in 13 games. Their their point differential suggested that they should have been more of a, a nine and seven team. Uh, they did not get better in the offseason. Uh, if anything, they got worse. There <laughs> might be a disconnect. And this is one of those things that I kind of like to glean from from these reports where you don't even need necessarily uh, preseason or anything like that. Just kind of understanding Green Bay that there may be a disconnect between the floor and the the front office and the GM because you know I found out that the the GM and, you know Gutenkust he's doing a lot more in the draft process with his guys. They kind of threw a floor of bone with that uh Deguara pick, but you know a lot of people are high on a guy like AJ Dillon. A lot of people were head scratched, you know, scratching their head about Jordan Love. But then you're like, oh, it makes a lot more sense if you think about it from the perspective of the front office. Is like, hey, this this Lafleur guy is playing Aaron Jones so much that he's going to want too much money. He's, he played himself into too big of a contract. We're going to draft this Dylan guy. Dylan might be a healthy scratch this year uh, to start the year. Then you have Jordan Love. They draft him. They don't draft the receiver. And then LaFleur's out here saying, hey, I want Aaron Rodgers to be my quarterback for a long time, this and that. It's very possible LaFleur wasn't on board with that pick. So just kind of understanding that, you know, with, with, you know, you say, OK, well, the Packers maybe aren't as likely to play certain draft picks or, or you know, do things that you may think from other decisions that they've made. And um, that, you know, you can just you, that information is just kind of good to know as you progress through the season. So uh, things like that um, uh, are what I'm looking for. But, uh, yeah, the 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 really, I think the the best values I've found are um, just kind of betting like those second or third place teams in certain divisions and, uh I got the Seahawks over on their win total, but generally I'm betting unders on win totals. Uh, the Falcons uh, are a team that I think really didn't get better in the, in the off season. And, um, you know, they're, they, Dan Quinn just has struggled, especially he struggled to kind of meet expectations. He's been really bad versus the spread, which is another thing I like to look at for coaches, because that just means you're not getting your team to play up to what's generally a fair expectation of what they should, because the market is pretty efficient. Um, so Dan Quinn, you know, when the Falcons are favorites in a lot of spots, they aren't very good. And then, you know, at, uh, when they're, you know, underdogs by like more than three, they're, they're pretty bad. So like immediately I, I jumped on Seattle, uh, you know, going to Atlanta in, in week one at like a pick em. I think the line has since moved to Seattle being favored, which it should have been the whole time. But um, things like that can kind of slip through. So just understanding that, always understanding, again, what's the 50% most likely outcome? Because a lot of times the lines will be shifted to what the public, the general public, is likely to bet. Because the books are just trying to draw, you know, either, you know, even action on both sides or, or action toward what they think is the square side. Chris, I like what you said about Seattle and how Russell Wilson sets a pretty high floor. Uh, I'm pretty glad I didn't bet under their win total last year, even though I wanted to with how bad their defense was. You really got to look at the quarterback position. Can you apply the same logic to Deshaun Watson in, in Houston this year? Absolutely. I bet that's another. I, I don't really bet overs uh, often on any type of prop. Uh, really, even in on totals outside of certain spots in the NBA, because they're just such talented players in the NBA now, and um, you can kind of do a lot of things with projecting pace if you understand it in in, in different situations. And like NBA game script is a whole other topic that we, you know, obviously we don't, <laughs> we don't have time to discuss, but such an edge there. So. Um, yeah, I think the Houston Texans, their win total, seven and a half. And, you know, bet the over, think, and people have to understand that a quarterback and, you know, your projection based on that quarterback of passing efficiency, which quarterbacks, I'm always looking for, like, um, at what point does a sample become useful, which means uh, it stabilizes or it becomes more stable, you know, about where more than uh, 50% or greater of the you know variation can be explained uh, by what we've seen already. So with quarterbacks, by the time you get to three, 400 dropbacks, which is usually in one season of data, uh, you can make predictions about a quarterback's efficiency, um, you know, his completion percentage, everything but really interception rate and, and to some extent touchdown rate. But, um, you know, the like, adjusted yards per attempt, which incorporates both of those things, is actually very predictable early on. So um, that is going to have such an outlying impact on the spread more than any other factor. Like if you're talking 
the magnitude of passing efficiency and like, the quarterback essentially versus running game, it's, you know, it's like 10 times more important. And a lot of people don't understand that. Like, you know, the running game is like a fraction of what's, you know, determining the final outcome. Because if you think about it, it's, you can pick your spots at running. Like if you, if you're a bad running team, you could just pass and passing is more efficient. And even when you are you know running, you're still getting like four or five yards a carry uh, or five yards a carry is considered efficient. That's still nothing compared to, you know, the eight, nine, 10 that you're getting if you're an efficient passing team or, or just having an efficient stretch or game or whatever. So, um, you know, just kind of understanding what really influences the spread versus all the noise. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of spreads, you mentioned that you already bet Seattle in week number one, and you actually had an entire piece up on the Action Network detailing the different spreads you bet for week one back in when the, the schedule was released. So you've been thinking about this for a while. Are there any lingering lines, any lingering numbers you still like, uh, see with value with two weeks before the regular season? Yeah, so you know the reason I bet some of those lines early is because I knew I was going to bet them anyway, and uh, a lot of times the best value in a line can be right when it comes out, uh, especially uh, more so for favorites, I think. But because there's so much uncertainty, a lot of times you will find kind of, you know, some favorites that you're, you're – and again, favorites are kind of like overs. You should generally be looking to avoid them. But um, in certain spots, I think it makes sense. But I still like Seattle, um, you know, as, as a short fave uh, against Atlanta. That's I think that's clearly – uh, edge Seattle in what the, the books are essentially pro- projecting is like a toss up game. Um, so, so that's the one that really uh, sticks out the most. And, and I still like the bills uh, at less than a touchdown against the, the jets. I know some, some money has come in on the jets, but uh, not buying it. Sean McDonough, uh, Sean, excuse me, <laughs> Sean McDonough, Sean McDermott <laughs> uh, is a, a very good coach and I love what he's done in Buffalo. Um, they've con- consistently exceeded expectations and uh, th- they play well within um, you know, what they have, and, and they got better this offseason. They might have finally kind of unlocked the best way to use Josh Allen. Like, you're never going to make him a high-volume passer, but um, a lot of things that kind of got blamed on Josh Allen weren't weren't really his fault. You know, he's a guy that can, can sling it deep, and everyone's kind of calling him inaccurate, but he was perfectly fine when he was throwing deep to John Brown. Uh, but he was 3-4-27, throwing to a combination of Cole Beasley, Robert Foster, uh, who was it? Duke Williams, Isaiah McKenzie, all those replacement level guys. Uh, well, Beasley's a fine receiver. He just shouldn't be targeted right. 20 yards down the field. Uh, so, you know, you replace that with Stephon Diggs, who was per pro football focus, the number one receiver in terms of deep catches, uh, yards, touchdowns last year, the most, and one of the most efficient as well, uh, on low volume, mind you, like even lower volume than the Bills. Uh, you know, had passing wise last year in Minnesota. So uh, that could be a really key piece uh, in, in, you know, he's going to give you added rushing efficiency on the ground. They added a good uh, player in Zach Moss, um, you know, to to kind of, you know, they're a team that I think the running game matters a little more because uh, they're so good on defense. The under, it has an amazing hit rate in games that, uh, that, that, that Allen has started. So Buffalo's are kind of a really consistent team. Uh, their defense doesn't usually make big mistakes. They have, you know, great play on the back end. And uh, they're, they're usually one of my favorite teams to bet, whether it's the under or, or them to cover a spread that's a little shorter because um, people aren't kind of incorporating. You know, when you talk about quarterback efficiency, um, rushing is going to play into that to a certain extent. Um, and also, the, you know, the volume. So with Buffalo, because they play good defense, um, they're not having to, to, to use a whole lot of pass volume and really expose Josh Allen's um, potential deficiencies. Um, they're really consistent at not doing that. So they're usually undervalued. So um, Buffalo is a, a team that I love to bet. I think the Jets are generally going to be a, a disaster. I mean, you look at like what we've heard out of the Jets camp. Adam yeah. Gates still has an infatuation with players that aren't good. Frank Gore and Chris Hogan. Uh, you have <laughs> a team that got really lucky down the stretch last season um, in terms of winning some games that they, they really, uh, you know, either the matchup was just so, you know, so easy or, you know, they just had no business even winning and, and they pulled off a couple and made their season look respectable. Um, but this is a team that uh, this is like a five and 11 team that's going to go to struggle. And I think they're just so kind of uh, ambiguous that people don't really realize how bad they are. Adam Gase, kind of a familiar name, but, uh, it's likely to be uh, a disaster this year uh, in uh, in the Meadowlands. 
you're talking about Josh Allen. I remember Robert Foster's default box score last year was one target, zero catches, 60 air yards, like every single time. And uh, there were a lot of passes that just flew on past him. But we, I mean, yeah, no, Stefan Diggs does make a difference. That's that's yeah. better. And, and, you know, if you want to think about maybe you're skeptical on Diggs, look at John Brown's statistics before coming to Buffalo. He was one of the most inefficient receivers in the league. His catch rate uh, for his career hovered around 50%. I think he had a few seasons under that. Um, just a, a, a guy who, you know, wasn't, you know, catching the ball at, at a high rate. You know, quarterbacks weren't really getting the ball to him, wasn't able to, to be very efficient or productive um, consistently. And then he comes to Buffalo and has, the, you know, the most consistent and best year of his career, I think. Um, and, and most of the numbers back that up. So uh, Diggs could be a major addition. And, and, you know, going back to the point on quarterbacks and, and kind of when things start to become predictive, we now have uh, about, uh, you know, 800 or so dropbacks on, on Sam Darnold. We have a lot of data on Sam Darnold, and he's uh, below average pretty much across the board in every metric. Like, there's not one metric that Sam Darnold stands out on. And, and, and a quarterback is really just a component of his, uh, you know, yards per attempt, his touchdown rate, his uh, interception rate, and his sack rate, if you're really thinking about his efficiency, you know. And there's just nothing to point to for Sam Darnold that's uh, above average or – even average. So yeah. Sam Darnold, he might not be like 32nd, but he's like a consistent, like, you know, 20th to 25th or, or high teens at best. Yeah. Uh, and that's just not good. And that's not going to get it done. And every team thinks they have a franchise quarterback. Um, if he's a guy that like started for more than a season and didn't completely like blow up, but like the NFL these days is so spread out that offenses are just more efficient across the board. Interceptions are way down. Uh, but that so that's not necessarily translating. You have to kind of think of uh, of it relative. And, and you know, Sam Darnold is always going to be a guy, or at least he's been a guy to this point that uh, his efficiency is just not there. And um, you know, usually that's the type of team that that you want to bet against. Yeah, Sam Darnold right now is a less exciting Jameis Winston, which is not exactly what you want at your quarterback. That is Chris Raybon. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at Chris Raybon and. Check out all of his work on the Action Network and in the Action Network app as well. Chris, we appreciate you swinging by. Good to have you back over here at Number Fire for a couple of minutes. Appreciate it as always, and good luck this NFL season. Thanks for having me, guys. Let's get this money. <laughs> Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Chris Raybon for swinging by and talking about this upcoming NFL season. Again, follow him on Twitter at Chris Raybon and check out uh, the Action Network NFL podcast, the FSGA award for best betting podcast or radio show for this past season. Ed, a lot of good stuff from Chris, which is not a surprise. As mentioned, he's, he's a really smart guy, but just so much to dig through there. I thought it was a fun conversation. Absolutely. A couple things. You know, he talked about how the NBA uh, is a little bit more predictable. Um, that's true. And actually something I I'll talk a little bit about in covering the future. I uh, talked about how interceptions, you can't really get that in a, in a small sample size. And that's also true. And also something I'll talk about in covering the future as well. Uh, and I also got a chance to talk about Deshaun Watson in Houston. And you can probably tell by the way I asked that question, which way I'm thinking about that <laughs> as well. I'm not going to talk about that in covering the future, but <laughs> probably in a covering the future pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a fascinating team. So yeah, lots of good stuff from that conversation. Really enjoyed it. And uh, I mean, clearly he thinks in the right way about yeah. well, uh, and how to deal with these bets. And, and uh, I thought that was great. The predictability of the NBA is also key for other things outside of betting, too. Like, from a DFS perspective, when you get a sample size of however many possessions it is per game, that's a whole heck of a lot more possessions than you have in the NFL. And yep. that stabilizes things. You have a larger sample size, things can stabilize more quickly, and having that knowledge of that of that sample size is, is just so... It's so nice, and it helps you make better decisions, too. So I think that it was pertinent that he brought that up, not just for betting, uh, but also for stuff like Daily Fantasy as well. So big thank you yep. once again to Chris. Check out his work at the Action Network and the Action Network NFL podcast as well. Let's dive into covering the future. And, Ed, you mentioned that uh, we there was some overlap, which is nice, between what Chris was saying and what you have to say. Chris was talking about how predictions or how interceptions are not as predictable as other things. And... Just so happens you're doing a little study about exactly that right now. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I don't need to tell anyone who's listening to this that interceptions mean a lot. They're big plays. Uh, if you do a little regression analysis, you can show that every pick is worth about five points uh, or negative five points 
to the team that throws it. So so these these plays obviously have a big way of turning a game, but they're actually notoriously difficult to predict. So you can think about a quarterback's interception rate. You think about how sticky it is from season to season. So you're essentially asking what uh, the correlation between an interception rate last season with an interception rate this season. And so you can kind of think of this in terms of a plot, right? So you have um, on the y-axis, you have this year's interception rate. That's what you're trying to predict. On the x-axis, the horizontal axis, you have last year's interception rate. And hopefully you, you plot those points for all quarterbacks and you get like a relationship. They tend to hug a line. Um, that's not what you get at all with interception rate. Uh, so last year's interception rate explains about 7% of the variance in this year's interception rate. And essentially what that means is that scatter plot looks like a Jackson Pollock painting. <laughs> like there's, there's no relationship between the two quantities. And so this is entirely frustrating. So I started thinking about this and I was like, okay, well, okay. It's not very sticky from season to season, but how else can we think about it? And I started thinking about like, can we separate skill from luck in interceptions? And there's a really nice framework to do that. Uh, Michael Malbossian wrote a book called The Success Equation, and he, he did exactly this. Um, he, he asked, like, you know, how, how much skill is involved in, in a particular quantity versus luck. And luck, like, you know, luck, there's going to be, if, if NFL quarterbacks all um, throw 1,000 passes, right, there's going to be a little spread in their interception rates. So the NFL average is about 2.4% over the last uh, – uh, last six years, right? So you're going to expect a spread, and you know, uh, but it shouldn't be that big. So when you get someone like Jameis Winston, who's thrown over 2,000 passes, and he has an interception rate over this period of 3.5 percent, um, his spread should be within uh, 0.3 of the average, right? So it should be somewhere between 2.1 percent and 2.7 percent. So when he actually lands at 3.5 percent. He's three and a half standard deviations away from where he should be based on his number of pass attempts. So on the other side, Tom Brady has a 1.5% interception rate based on the number of pass attempts he's thrown. He's like four standard deviations better than average. Okay. So what you see is that like, so this is suggesting like the, the distribution of quarterback interception rate. It's a lot wider than we would expect just from random. And this is how you measure skill, right? Um, that excess variance means like, you know, their skill with these guys that, that in throwing interceptions. So when you do the analysis, you, you actually see that there's a lot of skill in throwing interceptions. When you do the analysis, uh, it's 66% skill. So it's like two thirds skill, one third luck in throwing interceptions. And so to kind of put that in perspective, um, so Malbossian did the same analysis for, teams in leagues so in the nfl you know you play 16 games you're going to expect a pretty big scatter because that's a small sample size um so whatever you know whatever um spread you get in excess of that is the amount of skill and you actually get the nfl is 62 percent skill in terms of teams winning games when you do the analysis for nba you have a 82 game season you're gonna, you're expecting a much smaller distribution just based on that number of games when you do the skill versus luck analysis it turns out the NBA is 88% skill. So what that that's exactly what Chris Raybon was talking about. Um, it's a little bit easier to predict the NBA because there's there's more skill involved. And when you see the team like the Phoenix Suns make a pretty good run, that's more predictive than you know an NFL team uh, making the same type of run. So um, so interceptions is is 67. It's it's high skill but very low predictability. And what's interesting is you actually, that's the same thing that you see with three point shooting percentage in the NBA. It's very high skill, 78%. Like we all know that shooting is a skill, but what has always like been really frustrating with three point shooting is the low predictability. It's not very sticky from season to season. Last season's uh, three point shooting percentage explains about 14.5% of the variance this season. So Jim, I think you asked me off air a couple weeks ago about how three point shooting and interceptions are related. That that's how. So you it, it you know predictability and skill are usually going to be related. So something like completion percentage in football, it's a skill, highly a skill, about eighty six percent, and it's sticky from season to season. Um, but that's not the case, and that's usually going to be the case. But in some cases, you you just don't get that, and interceptions is one. 
So this is the first part about like, you know, and that kind of suggests like we should be able to do better at predicting interceptions than just taking last year's interception rate. And um, that's what I get to into something I'm calling the pick report. Um, it's uh, a study about how to predict interceptions. Uh, you can do a lot better than that. And uh, I'll leave those details for uh, a future week. And the pick report will be up on the Power Rank and on the Football Analytics Show next week, you said? Or next week. Finish? Unless okay. I die. Yeah, it'll be up next week. <laughs> What's the what's the range of outcomes on Ed's death? Like, is that like a likely outcome at this point, or are we good? No, it's not. It's not okay, a good. likely outcome. But uh, you know, it's a, I mean, it's just it's just kind of stressful putting on the last. Like yeah. the written report is almost done, um, but I definitely wanted to do an audio version too, and yeah. wanted to put a bunch of figures in there as well because that yeah. definitely explains a lot of things. You can put your uh, new, your new YouTube skills to use there. Yeah, the YouTube is not the YouTube's not happening. In, in, for, <laughs> so let's <laughs> you're gonna get a report, you're gonna get some audio, and you're gonna get a data file. I was That's gonna it. put more work on your plate if that was okay. What's it's that? gonna shove more work on your plate. <laughs> That's my job here. Yeah. Okay. So so anyways, that's something. Um, and yeah, you can always sign up for me. The people on my email list uh, will will get it first. Perfect. Actually, members of my site will get it first. But um, but yeah, sign up for that email list at powerrank.com and, and uh, we'll definitely let you know about it. Outstanding. All right. So with my covering the future for today, one to focus on week one because we had Chris on today. And if he's going to post all of his week one stuff in June, I should probably get to my first week one bet on August 26th. So let's do that right now. Spreads are fun. I tend to have more success betting totals than spreads. And I think that's especially true for teams that have undergone big changes in the offseason. And not many teams have had more change than the Carolina Panthers this year. And that's why I like the over in their game with the Las Vegas Raiders, which is currently at 46 and a half. It is minus 115 on the over. So do note that a little bit juicy, but I still think the over is the play here. There are a couple of aspects on the Panthers' changes that play well towards an over, especially early on. The first one is their offense, because they've added Joe Brady as offensive coordinator. And LSU was 25th in the nation in pace last year as far as plays per game go, and they were more than willing to air things out. And if you read into what Joe, what Joe Brady has said so far this year, kind of seems like they want to skew that way in the NFL as well. We should expect... The same here for this week, or for this year, even if Teddy Bridgewater is not exactly Joe Burrow relative to his peers at that respective level. The defense also, I think, should make us lean towards higher scoring games because Carolina last year was 23rd in schedule adjusted offense or defense overall. They were 13th against the pass, and that matters a lot. 13th against the pass is a good thing, but they've lost so many contributors on that side of the ball that... That doesn't matter, and they weren't even that good to begin with. Their entire draft was defensive players. They did not draft a single offensive player, and they're probably going to have to start a lot of those rookies with all the losses they've had. They're going to struggle defensively. And the Raiders may not be the world's most exciting offense, but they were decently efficient last year. They've added Peasons on offense to potentially make that offense uh, you know, higher upside in a single-game perspective so they can score some points. I think the Panthers are going to be a team where we consistently want to bet the over to open the season. I think that offense should go at a decently fast pace. I think that defense is probably going to suck. So I want to lock in right now my first bet for week number one and go with the over on 46 and a half points for the Panthers and the Raiders. I don't have a great lean on who will win that game, but I'd expect there to be a lot of points, and I'm excited to see if that one plays out, and that'll be a stack for me when it comes to Daily Fantasy in week number one. Ed, what are your expectations for the Panthers, given all the uncertainty, given Joe Brady going to the NFL? Any expectations for them heading into this year? I, I certainly like uh, getting Teddy Bridgewater as your quarterback. Um, I think he, he's a guy that's, that, that's a clear upgrade. Uh, I'm a little less bullish on Joe Brady. I think he had he had one season at LSU where everything went right, and I don't know if that's Joe Brady or uh, uh, what's his the <laughs> other Joe B. <laughs> Why can't I remember the guy's name? Joe uh, Burrow or Joe Burrow? Yeah. yeah, is that Joe Burrow? The other Joe, Joe B. Brady. Yeah. Um, but I I don't know. I'm not I'm not high on Joe Burrow. I I I, I can't see that guy having success this year at Cincinnati. I can't believe they're even going to throw him out there. Um, so. 
yeah, I, I don't, I don't. From that perspective, I don't know what to think about about Carolina. I, I will note that the the numbers on Oakland from last year, you know, their pass offense was fourth in my adjusted passing success rate. Their their defense was 29th in pass defense by adjusted success rate. So that's certainly pointing to some overs and um, supporting exactly what you're saying. I wanted to go over. I want those stacks. Teddy Bridgewater week one in DFS. Like it could go terribly. But it might not. That's that's my DFS philosophy. It may go terribly, but it might not. What could be more uh, committal than that? That is all that we have for this week here on Covering the Spread. Make sure, once again, you check out Chris Raybon's work over at the Action Network. Check him out on the Action Network NFL podcast, the award-winning Action Network NFL podcast. And check him out on the Action Network app as well if you want to follow his bets. And follow Chris on Twitter at Chris Raybon. Uh, Ed, what else you got going on this week, or is it all just uh, preparation this week for the pick report? Well, there, there, there's a ton of prep, um, but I did want to mention I had Shio Kapadia from the Athletic on my podcast. Great conversation. So he's written three thousand words on thirty-two NFL teams. Uh, going <laughs> I don't want to do the math on that. That sounds that sounds frightening. It's it's a it's a pretty good sized novel at ninety six thousand words. <laughs> um, so I talk, and they're all from an analytics perspective. So a lot of good things, uh, a lot of good numbers in there. But also does the uh, the whole journalist thing where he tells you about all the personnel moves and yeah. coaching changes and and stuff. So so we talked about his process for doing that, how he came up with doing it, kind of the horror of actually <laughs> going through <laughs> with thirty two previews, which which is obviously an, like an unbelievable amount of work and yeah. also take, talking to Chris today like I had a really good conversation with him about the Packers and just how misaligned the idea of like um you know the, the basically the fact that that Matt LaFleur ran a lot when he was an offensive coordinator at Tennessee you know they drafted Dylan they drafted Jordan Love so so maybe yeah maybe maybe they're not high on Rodgers um and you can obviously see that in some of their numbers from last year uh some of their efficiency numbers so Obviously, Rodgers is going to be the starter this year. There's no doubt about that. But how is that going to play out? Uh, really good conversation about that. Um, and also some conversations about some trends in the NFL, playing more defensive backs, uh, things you notice when you're trying to cover all thir- 32 teams. So that was on the Football Analytics Show. All right, so check that out on the Football Analytics Show. Make sure you're subscribed to Ed's newsletter, too, to get the pick report once it is out. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that next week as well. I am on Twitter at Jim Sanis, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. A lot of DFS stuff going on right now. We have MLB, NBA, NHL, UFC, NASCAR, uh, DFS podcasts all going up right now over on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. Weekly Q&A shows on YouTube, too, uh, to get you set for that day's MLB DFS action. So make sure you are checking all of that out. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer from the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in to Covering the Spread. Good luck with your NFL Week 1 bets. We are getting set for that, uh, NBA, whatever it may be. Hopefully things go in your favor. We'll talk to you again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.